Thanks very much. So, well, as I said, very packed. So I think we should start with our power, power, power panel. Uh, the first one uh, in uh, this, mo uh, this morning. Uh, it's a topic that is an evergreen, uh, an evergreen topic, and it's, it's never. We, we couldn't discuss it uh, too many times, I think. Uh, so I'm very, very happy to have all these great speakers uh, with us. Uh, how to finance independent films in the age of streamers. And I'm very proud to please welcome on stage our moderator, Andreas uh, from Deadline. Alex Bronner, UTA. Emily Schock, Memento, Patrick Waxberger, Picture Perfect, and Christine Vachon, Killer Films. Thank you so much for being here. Frank Smith. Oh, here. Does this work? Yes. Great. It's great to see so many of you here, nice and early a lot more than at nine, which is when I thought this started. So I was uh, pacing up and down at two minutes to nine thinking, wow, my panelists are leaving it uh, late, very cool. Thinking deadline was a great draw for everyone. Um, but thankfully it was 9.40 and you're all here. Um, we've got a blockbuster panel to start the day, uh, as Rita was saying. And I'm gonna introduce each of the panelists. Um, how to finance independent films in the age of streamers. Uh, as Rita says, an evergreen topic. Uh, we have on my immediate left here, Frank Smith, president and CEO of Walden Media, a veteran producer financier, um, president of uh, Walden and Anschutz Film Group. Uh, recent credits include The Babysitter's Club, seasons one and two, uh, as well as features including Finch on Apple TV+, Rumble on Paramount+, uh, theatrical releases Everest, The Dog's Purpose, uh, The BFG, uh, and Wonder. Prior to AFG, Smith was VP of Business and Legal at New Line. Uh, next to Frank, we have Christine Vachon of Killer Films. Christine uh, will be well known to you all. Uh, one of the indie sector's most respected producers uh, will be known for a string of acclaimed movies, including Carol, Far From Heaven, Still Alice, Boys Don't Cry, Kids, uh, and TV series such as Mildred Pierce for HBO. Uh, next to Christine, we have Patrick Waxberger, uh, founder and CEO of Picture Perfect Federation. Uh, you will know him as one of the doyens of the international sales business, uh, a leader at Summit and Lionsgate, uh, and now more recently a collaborator with Federation uh, on his new company, uh, recently a producer and heavily involved in the financing on Best Picture winner Coda, which I'm sure we'll speak about. Uh, and of course, known for the Twilight franchise, The Hurt Locker, Step Up, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and many more. Uh, next to Patrick, we have Emily George, uh, who is a very well-known sales executive uh, and CEO of the recently launched Paradise City, uh, a new production and talent management venture, which she runs alongside the blue chip uh, French sales firm Memento International. Among movies she has shepherded are Luca Guadagnino's Call Me By Your Name and Asuka Fahadi's Oscar winners A Separation and The Salesman. And next to Emily, uh, finally, we have Alex Brunner, who is an agent at the UTA Independent Film Group. Uh, and uh, Alex is, uh, focuses there on the global finance packaging, distribution strategies uh, for independent movies, and he's worked on a string of great movies, including The Father, Hidden Figures, Hustlers, Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, and Peppermint. So we have a fantastic, fantastic panel, a uh, great constellation of people with different experience uh, on this subject. And I thought, given that they are all at the coalface of, of the independent sector, we could maybe start by each of them just giving us a brief example of an indie movie they've worked on recently and how it came together uh, from a finance and, and a creative sense. And I think we'll probably come back to those throughout the session. So do you want to start for us, Frank? Sure. Um, 
You know, it's, it's, it's rather interesting because my company wasn't historically in indie films. We dabble here and there over the years. We made Amazing Grace and various films doing, um, you know, farm pre-sale model and such. Um, but the world is changing and uh, we are a self-financed company. Um, I don't need to go to outside sources, as Patrick knows. I, I, I usually put the financing in films. I call you an actor. <laughs> yes, he's called me many times. Wonder. Um, but the challenges that we're facing now with streaming is that uh, it's becoming more and more difficult for me to find places to deploy my capital, right? So I'm, I'm trying to put together many different types of films right now, and I'm trying different uh, ways of doing it. Um, the streamers are not that interested. They're either interested in, in just uh, paying for it and owning it, or if you're lucky enough, you can get a cost plus deal and you make it, which we are a financier and a producer, we can make it and make money off of it. But it's becoming more and more difficult uh, for, for in my world. And I have capital to deploy and I'm finding it more and more difficult. So um, most recently we have uh, a film that I've been trying to put together, uh, an independent film, Billion Dollar Spy, uh, you know, 13, 14 million dollar uh, film. And uh, you know, we're doing the foreign pre-sale model um, and then we have the streamers sniffing around, and, and then you wonder, which way do I go? I don't want to lock myself up uh, in foreign pre-sale and bringing in finance partners, and then a streamer is going to come and say, no, we'll just buy the whole thing out. You know, so it's, it's a balancing act. Sure. Okay, we're going to definitely come back to that balancing act. Uh, Christine, maybe you could tell us a little uh, about a project you've been working on recently. Well, you know, I would... I. What I would also, you know, I, I, I would echo a lot of what Frank said, and although we are not self-financed, but we are dealing with, we, we've, Killer has made more movies in the past two years than I think we've, we've made, I think, around eight. And this is a six-person company. So we've, uh, I, part of that, I think, was the backlog of the pandemic that, that a lot of us experienced, just like that sudden acceleration of production. But I think some of it also is there's such, you know, financing these, figuring out the financing for these kinds of independent films has become so bespoke that uh, there's very few companies that actually can thread those teeny weeny little needles. Current projects for us right now, um, you know, we, uh, we just wrapped a film. Uh, many of our projects actually are with people here in this room. We just wrapped a film for A24 with a second time director that they took a shot on. And, um, and that was a very traditional, we made a movie, you know, for a studio and they financed it. But we're about to start shooting the Todd Haynes film, which was a foreign sales model with rocket science, um, with uh, Natalie Portman and Julianne Moore and some equity investors and a bank. And that kind of financing, I keep feeling every year like, this is the last year we're gonna be able to do this. And then somehow, like, you know, the phoenix rising from the ashes, it kind of stumbles to its feet, and we do it again. And, um, and then, of course, yes, the streamers, that's a whole other, that's a bigger discussion because that becomes about ownership and about longevity and evergreens and your, your and copyright and what your role is. I mean. I have been doing this for so long uh, that we are now, you know, license, films I licensed 25 years ago, which had never occurred to me 25 years ago when I signed a license for 25 years that I'd be alive. Uh, you know, so what those are starting to come back to us now and it's very interesting as we try and figure out their lives. So I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, the. That French pro proverb, the more it changes, the more it stays the same, is still very, very, I think is very accurate. But we are dealing with uh, some new challenges that um, are definitely specific to the times we're in. Well said. Patrick? Hello. Yeah. So everything which was said so far by the two participants there were totally accurate. So. I'm really looking at the business from my standpoint today being independent. In other words, uh, I don't have to feed the beast anymore. You know, at Lionsgate it was like about doing 12 movies a year. Uh, that's not the case. So I think the first, the first important thing from my standpoint is to go alone as long as possible. In other words, you have to spend the money and the time to develop the project 
uh, and I'm trying to do that on my own. If uh, I'm dealing with <coughs> expensive riders, sometimes I do bring a 50-50 partner. Now the next question is then what? Um, when you go to the independent route of licensing movies foreign uh, and you know the studio, I think there is probably today a budget cap. And let's talk about what the budget cap is. I think today when you go into the $15 million budget range, you kind of capping it. Now, how do you do that? Um, first of all, Christine was talking about the, uh, the, uh, the platform. You know, going and doing a $15 million budget movie and going to a streamer at a, from the get-go and say, cost plus 15%, and if you're lucky, cost plus 20%, why? Let's stay home. So um, the movie I'm doing now, I'm doing a movie with my uh, <coughs> old partner, Eric Feig, who actually wanted to make a deal with a streamer. And we're doing this movie for a net budget of about $30 billion, 13.5. So I said to Eric, I said, look, uh, why don't I go to the market to a couple of theatrical distributors, two or three countries, two distributors per countries, see if they buy the bullet. <coughs> if, they buy the, if, if it doesn't work, you know what? We'll do the plan B. We'll go and do the streamers. And actually, I licensed the movie by myself at home during the pandemic in 10 days to all the key distributors. Now, I needed some equity, you know, and we decided to put some equity to finance the rest of the movie. Is that the movie we spoke about that's the remake? Oh. This is, the, uh, this is an, uh, an adaptation of, uh, of a Thai movie which was the biggest success Thai movie of all time called Bad Genius. First time director and really no real cast to sp speak for. Yeah, watch this space on that one for sure. Um, Emily. Yes, hello. Um, for um, really independent world uh, directors and projects, I think streamers are not the target at all, first, I have to say. There's no way you can bring uh, offers from streamers for to finance, uh, you know, call me by your name, or to finance uh, Anthony Chen or Asghar Fahadi or um, you know, these great directors from all over the world. So this is not even a discussion um, f uh, to finance. And um, so what's our route? As Alex said at the beginning, uh, now other um, financiers are also going into uh, this route of financing independent movie from the world, taking the risks, exploring um, new new options. So, um, and I, what I can say is this traditional model that you were talking about, financing through an MG, uh, or having individual territories for the world directors, is getting more and more sparse, to say the least. Um, meaning, most probably, you cannot count on individual uh, territory pre-sell to finance movies like this. So, what, what is left, right? How do we finance these movies? Um, I can speak of uh, my recent example um, as a producer, which is Drift. We have the Greek producer somewhere in the room with us. Drift is um, Anthony Chen's third film. Anthony Chen won uh, the camera door for Ilo Ilo a few years ago. Um, he has, he's from Singapore, but based in London. Um, he felt in love with an American book called A Marker to Measure Drift. Um, and we've decided, together with Peter Spears, with whom we made Call Me By Your Name, to um, attach um, Anthony, have um, an Irish writer for, for him to adapt the book. Um, and we've financed the film in a very uncommon way, but that's most probably the new way for uh, the international high-level uh, production. Um, 
we first we structured the film as the film was shot in Greece, so there was plenty of Greek element to qualify as a Greek production. Um, we had rights and talents coming from the UK, so we went through, we could benefit from the British test and qualify for the UK um, to be a British co-production. But our, and we signed the right out of France because I'm, I'm France-based, so the co production company is based in France. And we knew that plenty of uh, the head of departments would be French and maybe some uh, cast as well. So typically uh, a very international production. The, our issue was to not to have uh, the French element very dominant because we don't have rights. I mean, we don't have writers or directors f uh, French, which uh, makes the, the project very difficult to embrace as a French film. Um, so we've decided to take the risk and uh, create a link between Greece and the UK, which they don't have a co-production treaty. So we were the missing link, right? France would be the central production and a minority co-production out of the UK and a minority co-production out of Greece. And then, then what? Because public fundings in these territories for English-speaking movies shot in Greece with a Singaporean uh, director, what do you do? <laughs> um, and then we've explored uh, the venues of equity financiers and we found equity financiers through the talents. Um, and th some were coming from, equity was coming from China for Anthony Chen, for the director. And some equity uh, was coming from the US for um, the great actress Cynthia Erivo, uh, someone that was supporting her as well. So the financing is quite exceptional. Um, we have a European co-production, French, British, Greece, with equity financiers coming out of China and I would like to ask US. you a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> How long did it take you to put all those pieces together? Um, uh, three months. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it could be three years, I think, right? Um, Alex? I'll be, I'll be quick because... Uh, you won't, we won't get through it all. I'm the last bloke on the, on the, on the thing. Um, I, I guess the original question is films you're working on, or how did it come together? And we'll use the example of Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. It's a film that's coming out in the UK next weekend. It's a British-Hungarian co-production. And uh, our, our client, Anthony Fabian, wrote it, developed it from a series of beautiful, you know, well-known books. Uh, and with Xavier Marchand, they structured it out of Hungary. We got the Hungarian Film Fund to invest. We got the Hungarian tax credit of 30%. Nick Meyer and Iwan came in for the world, put up an MG and decided, let's, let's hold our sales and hold the MG as soon as they started seeing footage. Um, and we got the film and sold it off promo. Um, it was the first you know, acquisition from Focus of a, of a Hungarian British film. But that, that structure and, you know, was the only way to get a movie like that made. And we shot all the most of the movie in Hungary and then in the UK and then in Paris. Um, but it's one of those movies where you checked all the boxes from the structure to an MG and then the House of Dior, which, I, which will come later about product placement, also came in with a material, forgive the pun, investment of all the dresses and the costumes. I'm not sure if anyone's seen the film yet, but... Uh, so it was, it was, it's, we've all talked about how hard it is to make these movies now, but the, the structure that we've, all been, we've been playing with for the last couple of decades still comes up. It's, it's still, I mean, what you yeah. said it exactly right. It's just, just, just when you think, you know what, we can't pull this off like this, and then it, you yeah. get a little miracle like that. Which is, yeah, it's interesting to hear how much those cornerstone finance elements are still the ones we're turning to. But let's say you don't do that and let's say you jump in with a streamer to which is happening more and more on packages that start out independent to what extent do you see that as a silver bullet and what are the pitfalls if you do do that maybe 
some of you could talk about if you do jump in with a streamer, rather than going the route that we've talked about, which a lot, which to be honest, you know, these movies get made, but the alternative, what are the challenges and opportunities there? I can say that the interesting thing is, and this is good for filmmakers in the room, we have projects right now that have been in gestation for 15 years, projects that Patrick passed on <laughs> that I'm selling <laughs> to streamers. So it, it's incredible. It's an incredible time and things are getting made. So, you know, it's, it sounds very pessimistic, but it's, it, it, as filmmakers, it's a great time. More product is getting made as a financier. This is where my problem is. No longer right now, I say no longer. Um, can I make a $19 million movie that does 203 or 300 million in box office and have a cash cow that covers the losses from these other films? It's, it's getting tougher and tougher. So the I make it a movie made the Ambassador Hotel in Hollywood. Years, but my the Hollywood Foreign Press Association presents uh, the, no, the upside is limited. Awards. And I'm on the hook for the over nearly 80 years. So, for instance, the Hollywood Foreign, Foreign Press Association Netflix, has built a foundation and a legacy. And this is absolutely extraordinary. Now is our time to change the world. Uh, but I have to the moments iconic. I'd like to give this to you, Mr. Jack Lemmon. So it's getting harder and harder, and that's that's the challenge we face. I mean, I think that's what it comes down to. I also feel like there's a really steep learning curve for talent, which doesn't really understand how drastically the business has shifted in terms of their profit participation and why they will agree to be in you know a first time filmmaker's film or a low budget film or what have you and that is really that's that's very challenging well I, there's a other elements is the fact that a lot of filmmakers now are basically taking the position to say you know what i want my movie to be in the theaters I don't want my movie to go straight to a streamer, and uh, and also dealing with talent. I mean, if you if well, you're basically it. trying to get a talent to defer, like I remember uh, with Keanu Reeves when we did the first John Wick, that uh, I really wanted to do. Not a lot of people at the company wanted to do. Um, he deferred a substantial amount of his his uh, his fees. If we were to do a deal with a streamer. Why would he do that? Exactly, but the one thing I want to add to that is I almost feel like we're, we're creating a sort of, I, I feel, you know, we always, I'm sure as, you know, all of us have always talked about what makes a movie theatrical and what, you know, why is this a film that will resonate in a theater because that was the business we were all in, right? I think now it's almost we're starting to make that delineation, like, this film is theatrical, and this film could be a streamer film. Sure. And what is it that makes it, you know, what, what is it that constructs one, you know, more than the other? I still believe theatrical filmmaking is original, audacious, provocative, all those things that drive people to the theater. But it's almost now we've created another category. Or we haven't, it has been created. Uh, I think you're, you're totally right. But there's one important phenomenon that we have to keep in mind, is that all those independent theatrical distributors, whether they are in France, in Italy, in Germany, wherever, they want theatrical, they want movies. They don't have any product anymore. Yeah. They are now, they, a lot of them are doing local production to feed their, to, to feed their machine, to feed the beast. So um, today you, you really can pretty much license theatrically to those independent distributors, any movie you're doing. On, I mean, on that subject, let me ask you, Patrick, do you think because Coda was obviously, you know, best picture winner, huge, you know, huge journey for that movie, to what extent do you think that movie would have had the same journey had it stayed entirely independent and not gone with a streamer? Well, it was another time, I mean. <laughs> The story of this movie goes like, um, so I, I, I developed this project at, at Lionsgate. It was not going to happen there. Took it out when I left. And, um, and basically start licensing the movie internationally uh, by myself without an assistant walking through the street of Cannes uh, in 2018. Um, the underlying rights to the original movie 
la famille Bélier at reverse back to my partner Philippe Rousselet. So we decided to work together in putting this movie together. Um, we needed some equity. You know, we we needed we, the the budget of the movie was about fourteen million dollars, one four. Um, we had a tax rebate um, in Massachusetts, but basically the Teamster took <laughs> all of it. <laughs> so um, then, um, you know, there was the pandemic. There was no theatrical market at all. Luckily, uh, we were selected to go to Sundance. We needed. The movie was in the can. I needed to show the movie somewhere. We needed a festival. We were picked up by by Sundance, and uh, and there was a you know a, a couple of platform who actually um, bid for for the movie. Um, I was told at the time, say, don't worry, you can buy back those territories that you sold, you know, to those distributors. Not quite. <laughs> Not anymore. So um, they basically said, look, you know what? If the movie was a piece of shit, you would not ask to buy it back. But I give you some money to get it back. No, 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 no. We trusted you. You deliver a movie. We're keeping it. So now there was a problem. I have a, a worldwide deal with Apple. And I was in conflict because I had sold the movie independently. So it happened that a lot of the territories, whether it's Japan, Scandinavia, Latin America, Spain, Italy, would not give the movie back. Uh, Apple was, they were great. They play ball and say, you know what? Fine, we'll deduct the amount of money that you received or you would receive from those independent distributors from the MG. Now the question, to answer your question, um, would this movie, uh, well, this movie would have been put together uh, as a theatrical movie. The question is, you know, would the movie have worked theatrically? I don't know. I don't know. Conundrum. I, yeah, if I may say about, I mean, not about Coda, but other examples, Still Alice. Um, revenues in the long run for films like Still Alice that we sold. Uh, we're, yeah. still, we're still getting profits. Yeah. yeah. And it was sold independently to individual territories, and that's probably uh, that's a very successful movie worldwide. Um, you know, for for the size of the movie and uh, compared to the advances that we've received, I don't think if we have if we were uh, selling this film to one stop shop, uh, we wouldn't have received at all the same uh, like very far from it, right? Um, so it's also a question of, first, theatrical will always be the best when a film is successful, number one, right? When it's successful, and only when it's successful. But... It has to be successful somewhere. I yeah. mean, as you basically sell the movie independently to various territories, if one territory works and the other one doesn't work, it's like, you know, yeah. you're going to get the benefit from the territory where it worked. Yeah. Okay. Yes, but um, do we, are we in position to, to do a film like Still Alice nowadays through the market to individual, sell it, pre-sell it to individual territories? Maybe, not sure. What was the budget? Uh, it was not, uh, I mean, Chris, yeah. Five, more or less. Yeah, yeah, you mm. can do it. You can do it easily. I mean, that's kind of what we're doing, though, with the new Todd Haynes. Yeah. I mean, that's but it's with Haynes. you know, yeah. it is. But it's also Julianne, and it's Natalie and it's Portman, a, yeah. and we are doing that same model. <gasps> sure, it's it, Todd Haynes, Julian Moore, and still, yeah, still need you, you need you need a level of elements that are so high to do that to perform the. Uh, pre-sell level for independent movies that uh, right now the option for independent films, I mean for a film like Still Alice probably we would get uh, a one-stop shop that probably wouldn't be a streamer right now that would finance the movie uh, and would we go for it? Probably yes, right? I mean on that subject let me ask you about what the creative elements are these days that are getting these 
movies over the line that are getting these projects noticed. I mean, we go into these uh, markets and we announce so many new packages, but are there any creative elements in terms of genre or particular directors or themes, subjects that are proving particularly fertile at the moment? Or I think it's the screenplay. I really do. I think it's the screenplay. Yeah, but it's, it's still talent, talent, talent. I mean, as Christine just pointed out, I mean, you know, you have Natalie Portman, various people. It's it's talent, and and the streamers, if you're going that route, I mean, they're 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 very desperate to to be associated with talent, so they well, the will do it. Yes, yes, the streamers, yes, and they'll also push it in in and spend more money, inordinate amounts of money, to push it for uh, awards. So it depends, but I find it's still talent, talent, talent. Are there? I'm going to open up to the audience for. Uh, some questions in a minute, so get your thinking caps on if you do have a question or two. Um, one last one from me. Are there any new players in the independent space that you're finding are, you know, are very active, that you're thinking about more and more? I mean, I'm, you know, thinking about distribution companies that are getting involved in finance or, you know, companies like Mubi or a studio like Fremantle in Europe or, you know, an A24 in America. Are there any companies in particular that you think are exciting new kids on the block? I mean, all of those. But, uh, but also, I think, I, I have found that there are, that there's been an interesting influx uh, in the American uh, equity scene of, of some younger investors uh, who are often investing at very early levels um, in development, uh, who often have, you know, they're investing with their head and their heart. Uh, like, there's a handful of new companies that we've been working with that has been, you know, kind of interesting. Okay. What I'm really trying to do on the, um, on the lower budget movies that we, we're developing is actually not to make a domestic deal up front. In other words, to play really the upside and, um, and take a chance. That sounds like a good idea. Any questions in the audience for our panelists? Is that a question there? No? No, I thought it's like being at an auction. Any bidders? One here at the front. Is there a microphone that this lady can have here? Anyone got a microphone? Shall I do it myself? Kim. Yeah, you can shout. Otherwise, okay, microphone coming. So far away. <laughs> maybe just, yeah, maybe you can say who you Hi. are. I'm Sasha from Netflix. I feel like I need to defend myself a little bit here. Um, <laughs> may I say that all of our directors and producers come back to us and want to work with us again. There are certainly benefits to working with the streamers. I come from the independent world, so I, I understand that. I understand that people want to have their films on cinemas in, in, in the theaters. We are here with All Quiet on the Western Front, which is in cinemas. We bring a lot of films into cinemas. Um, Emily, you were saying that it's out of the question that um, Netflix would finance these directors, but you know, last year, All Quiet is the German entry to the Oscars this year. Last year, I guess it was, Paolo Sorrentino, um, The Hand of God. That was entirely a Netflix. I, I would say that our goal is certainly to develop with the marketplace to find to be more and more flexible to make all different kinds of deals we want to be fair partners we don't want to screw someone out of things and talent who doesn't love talent but i think you actually have a better chance on netflix than theatrically without talent people we know that people like discovering new faces on netflix they like it less in theaters they want to have a headliner of someone that they know so i my question to you all is um, when do you think is the right time to work with streamers? You've all talked about the, the points where it's not good. Um, and I understand that, where you can make, you know, if something is a runaway success, you can earn more, you know, on, on, on the back end. But what, what kinds of films do you think, oh, no, this would be perfect? And, and, and Christine, you talked about, it's always what's theatrical and what isn't. But I would argue that Netflix has many, many theatrical movies. Um, you know, that I, on the border. I certainly don't disagree with you, but you also have to agree that there is almost a, another category that is sort of forming of a movie that, that doesn't have that same sense of urgency to get people to the theater. And you guys make them, and we make them, and sometimes, and sell them to you. Sure. Well, and, and, and as you were saying, Frank, that, that 
we also have films that have been in someone's drawer for the last 15 years, and right. they work on Netflix, and they're huge successes on Netflix, and they would never work anywhere else. That's right. But I would argue that we do all of them. The I love Netflix. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> I, 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 You're my favorite on the panel. <laughs> I, I want to make a point there. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, we produced Finch, uh, Tom Hanks' movie, with uh, uh, Amblin, and uh, it was set for a theatrical release with Universal. Uh, and the pandemic hit, and we kept postponing the release date. And it's a Tom Hanks movie. And Amblin calls me one day and says, you know what, would you be upset if we sold this to a streamer? And, uh, and I said, as, as long as I'm not losing money. And they said, no, you won't lose money. And we had a little bidding war, and uh, Apple stepped up to the plate, and we were thrilled. And the movie did phenomenally well. I think it was the number one watched movie ever on Apple. Um, I'm very proud of it. I can't believe how many people saw it. And I wonder if we had released it in the theaters, it would have done well, well enough. But the fact that it went to a streamer, it, it, was, it was hugely successful and made us very proud. So, proud. Um, you know. But the, the, your banker was not proud. Uh, no, 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 it, it, turned out to be, it turned out to be okay. This one turned out to be okay because it was a finished film. <laughs> And we had a little bidding war, so it wasn't too bad. And there's, you know, and, and the beauty of, and that's, it, that's an anomaly. You can't recreate that. That was the timing of the pandemic. Yeah. No P and A, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But, but streamers, you know, look, it's, it's the wave of the future, but we got to figure out the balance. And it's going to be interesting to see how that balance uh, plays out, you know, post pandemic, now that people have got used to a certain, a certain, a certain way and there were other considerations. Um, I think we'll probably wrap it unless there, was one yeah quick question up there we'll do one more quickly hi uh kim magnuson um just had a question because now we're all talking about uh, again this panel about the love and hate relationship to the streamers i think we all love them one way or the other but um also talking about you always talk about the theatrical distribution side and my point of view is i actually did work with netflix a couple of years back for a long period of time but my uh, understanding and what I feel is in the market, and I just want your view on it, is that I see that the streamers more and more are going to be open for that theatrical window. And now during COVID, when we actually saw that studio window was going down from the whatever, 100 days or 90 days down to 45, which now has become the norm. So the gap between the streamer window of three weeks to 45 is so little now. So I've just wanted your view on, do you think that very soon we're going to see that the streamers are actually becoming the biggest theater distributors in the world. Sasha? No. <laughs> Sasha, can you answer? Yeah, I mean, it's almost a question for all the streamers, really. I don't know if anyone has a... I don't know what to say. Yeah. Do you want to? You don't want to answer, Sasha, I'm sure. <laughs> film individually. Oh. Whoever didn't hear that, I said kind of loud. I said, we are in the streaming business. We're not in the theatrical business. But in a perfect world, we do the best for each individual film, whether it's theatrical, streaming, and different windows, and try and stay flexible. But we have no intention on taking over the theatrical market. Are you going to buy some theaters? <laughs> oh, God, I don't know. I don't know who you think I am. I don't, yeah. You know, <laughs> ask Reed. Some in the States. <laughs> No, not in your in your territory in Germany. In Germany, is that we don't have any plans in Germany? But we yes, we do have theaters around the world. We do. In, you were saying the Paris Theater in New York, for example. Yeah. Uh, but Sasha, then I think just quickly to clarify, the question wasn't that you guys would be distributing, and that's why my question is for the panel of independent and producers and financiers. I'm asking that if they negotiating with streamers and all that are seeing a better way of getting that theatrical window in there. And that's what I mean by then eventually, if all streamers are opening up to a small theatrical window, which also supports the launch on the streaming side, I see it in Scandinavia, that's getting more and more open-minded. So I'm asking those people up here who are dealing with you guys, if you were talking about it, you know, if you're feeling that or not. That was my question. Does anyone want to jump in on the theatrical window and whether they see that? Changing in light of the streamers quickly because I think we have to. Way too on. risky. 
we'll continue this conversation, I'm sure, throughout the day. Um, but I want to thank the panelists very much for their time. It's been really interesting. And like I say, I'm sure this discussion will, will go on and on. Thank you.